Hello aviation fans, Sky here, and today we'll delve into the habitat of some very special birds. Some people are impressed by their sheer size, others by their weight, while there are those who are astonished by their capacity. The story of our today's hero is filled with success and failures, with incredible innovations and controversial solutions. Allow me to introduce you to the grandpa of the large flying freighters. The C-133 Cargo Master is a heavy military cargo plane developed by Douglas Aircraft in the mid-1950s. It was the first turboprop heavy strategic airlifter in the US Air Force, and in a cruel irony, the last one. Well, it's time to jump into the time machine and find out what this aircraft was all about. The 1950s had just begun, and the world was living the jolly days of the Cold War. I'd like to outline right from the beginning that the C-133 was not the first American airlifter. Obviously, the geographic location of the United States was a very limiting factor when it came to moving forces around the globe. Most of this job was carried out by ships, but they are slow, and sometimes the decisions had to be taken swiftly. It was way faster to transport cargo by air, and this task was carried out by quite a decent fleet, consisting of such machines as the Boeing C-97 Stratofreighter and Douglas C-124 Globemaster II. But time did not wait. The needs of the military kept growing, and the prop planes of the 1940s already did not seem to be the ultimate dream. Besides, the world was getting acquainted with the gas turbine engines, which were very promising in terms of substantial improvement of the future aircraft performance. In the beginning of the 1950s, the US Air Force initiated the Logistic Carrier Support System program, assuming the creation of a new, faster, heavier and larger cargo plane. What's more, the required specifications were quite serious, so the aviators would not be able to get away with some simple modernization and tweaking of already existing models. The Douglas company was chosen to execute the program, since their designers had the most experience in this field. It was decided to start right away with a turboprop airplane. Piston engines had already reached the limits of their capabilities, while the jet engines were still deemed unreliable. Next on the list of changes came the entire philosophy of airframe design. Most of the older machines had the configuration of a low wing, which was optimal for usual planes but was not all that good for cargo aircraft. This left the cargo bay too high above the ground, which made it difficult to handle cargo, especially of larger sizes. Besides, the installation of the more powerful engines with longer blades would make it necessary to lift the plane with a low wing even higher, which would in turn add even more complexity to the landing gear. Taller chassis supports are not the best solution for operations on unpaved airfields. After all, it was meant to be a military transport, not a civil airliner. Therefore, the solution was obvious, it had to be a high wing plane. Now the wing, the engines and their blades were high enough above the ground. At the same time, the landing gear was now placed in separate fairings under the fuselage, which allowed the plane to be as squatty as possible. This meant that the fuselage could now be lowered as well, and that substantially facilitated the loading and unloading process. In fact, it did not take long for this configuration to gain popularity within the military transport aviation, as it was obviously more convenient. While Douglas was designing its planes, Lockheed was also working on its tactical transport aircraft, the C-130 Hercules. Oh yeah, this is one of those times when you can really feel just how old the most popular flying military freighter is nowadays. And yes, you heard it right, I said the Douglas planes. The aviators had two projects that were running simultaneously, the XC-132 and the XC-133. Although conceptually these two projects were quite similar, they were at the same time quite different, and surprisingly, the XC-132 seemed to be much cooler. It was a double-decker airplane with a swept wing, very powerful engines, and a maximum takeoff weight of 173 tons, 389,000 pounds. Just to put it into perspective, it was twice as heavy as the older piston engine planes. In addition to that, the wind tunnel test proved that it had an outstanding aerodynamic quality and some great potential performance. A nice foundation for a very similar giant that was created further down the road. However, back then the project was deemed overly complex and expensive, 
the powerful Pratt Whitney T57 engines could not guarantee stable operation, and their dimensions were a risky compromise from the reliability standpoint. Besides, the military considered its capabilities to be excessive. As a result, Douglas only got to build a mock-up prototype, and proceeded to complete the more moderate XC-133, which soon became known as the basic C-133. Well now, what was the C-133 all about? Just like its bigger brother, it was a high-wing airplane with four engines. However, it had a straight wing with quite a high aspect ratio. The power plant would consist of four Pratt Whitney T-34 turboprop engines, fitted with 5.5 meters or 18 feet long, three-blade propellers by Curtis Electric. The engine by itself was already quite a challenge for Pratt Whitney, as it was cutting-edge technology with lots of prospects and tons of risks. While the C-133 was still under development, the guys from Pratt Whitney were testing their engine on the flying lab based on the B-17, an unusual sight to see. Anyhow, 6,500 horsepower had to be sufficient for the new airlifter. It could fly at a cruise speed of 280 knots, 520 km per hour, and had a range of up to 6,600 km, 3,600 miles, with a standard payload. Considering its dimensions, it was decided to make the fuselage as simple as possible. The reason why most of it barely has any complex forms, making it look like a huge circular tube. The cargo area was considered to be huge for its time. 27 meters or 90 feet long and 3.7 meters or 12 feet wide. Yet in spite of its size, it was pressurized and heated. There were two ways to access the cargo bay. One large side door and another huge ramp in the back. The fuselage was raised a little in the aft section of the aircraft in order to free up some space from the load-carrying structure of the tail, which had a classic construction for its time. This made it possible to work faster with the cargo, and the cargo bay was adapted to work with practically all the machinery used by the US Army, from munitions and equipment up to heavy ones such as tanks and ballistic missiles. Unlike the XC-132, the 133rd was not a double-decker. But the space in the nose section was used more optimally in comparison to what was done before. Oftentimes, the doors with ramps in the older planes were found in the front. Now, the nose section had two levels. Down below it was store equipment and the nose landing gear, while in the upper section it would have the cockpit and the small rest cabin for the crew. In addition to that, a radar could be found inside a quite extruded nose cone. The standard crew consisted of five members, two pilots, a navigator, a flight engineer, and a cargo operator. The aircraft had a tricycle landing gear, just as it is expected to be on most airlifters. The nose landing gear has two wheels, while the main one consists of two pairs of bogies that sit on short legs, fixed inside the fairings on the sides of the fuselage. Low sitting and reliable configuration. In fact, this is what can be seen on most modern military transport planes. This solution worked just fine back then, and it was sufficient for an airplane weighing 129 tons, 286,000 pounds. What's more, when fully loaded, the C-133 could carry 50 tons or 110,000 pounds of cargo, or 200 soldiers. By modern standards, these figures don't look all that impressive, but bear in mind that we are in the 1950s. Back then, the C-124 was the reference in this class, but it weighed 30% less, and 34 tons of cargo carried at 260 knots with the limit of its capabilities. The C-133A, which got the name Cargo Master, made its maiden flight in April 1956. What's interesting is that it was already a serious plane meant to be delivered to the US Air Force, since the project did not assume the creation of prototypes. Deliveries to the Military Air Transport Service, or MATS, started in summer of 1957, and the new airplanes immediately set about their tasks, and, right away, beat several world records for cargo planes. This was no doubt a groundbreaking machine of its time. Basically, there wasn't even anything to compare it to. The first batch of the basic C-133As consisted of 35 aircraft. Considering that, to a certain degree, the plane was unfinished and had some issues, the guys from Douglas paid a lot of attention to the implementation of improvements, which in many cases were carried out individually from plane to plane. An important step was the creation of the full-fledged modification C-133B, where some of the shortcomings were solved and performance improved. 
The biggest change was the use of the forced Pratt Whitney T-34 engines, which generated 7500 horsepower each. Yet another particularity of the Model B were the new two-leaf doors with a ramp, which had completely cleared the entrance into the cargo bay of the plane. This was done to make it easier to handle one of the main types of cargo it had to carry – missiles. Yeah, already during the creation of the C-133, there were ideas that transporting the ICBMs, even the larger ones, would be faster and safer by air than on the ground, as long as the dimensions and the budget allowed to do so. In addition to that, such rockets as Thor, Atlas, Titan and Minuteman were being created at the same time. This meant that a lot of complex coordination was needed, to make several companies design their creations to be compatible with each other. Although in the case of the Thor rocket it was not that hard, as it was built by Douglas itself. Nevertheless, the operation of these aircraft was far from being smooth. The brand new turboprop engine had a limited resource and wasn't very reliable. Besides, the sheer dimensions of the plane did their thing. There were constantly occurring issues with vibration and some elements of the airframe would suffer from material fatigue. What's more, due to the fact that there were few C-133s and they were not unified with any other aircraft, there was always a lack of spare parts during maintenance. It was a problem for transport aviation, since the C-133s could not provide a proper flight readiness. And due to their high incidence rates, they were barely used to transport troops. The military were frankly afraid to see 200 souls in this plane, and they obviously did not develop a passion for it. In total, the Pentagon had placed an order for 15 C-133Bs, in hopes that it would soon be replaced by more reliable and effective airlifters. In fact, the problems had to do not only with regular operation, but with the plane's safety as well. Of the 50 planes that were delivered, 9 were lost between 1957 and 1971. That's quite an unsettling figure, even for military aviation. But the epic airplane did not give up. Already in the beginning of the 1960s, these cargo planes found a potential demand among different institutions. Its capacity to transport rockets was quite useful for NASA, which is why the cargo masters took an active part in the Mercury, Gemini and Apollo programs. A new round of this work started when the agency needed a transport plane capable of working with oversized cargo, the huge upper stage of the Saturn V rockets. Two companies wanted to be part of this program, Douglas with their C-133 and Aerospace Liners that wanted to modify the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser for this purpose. As strange as it may seem, the design features that made the C-133 an excellent military cargo plane were a barrier for this new incarnation. The thing is that cargo that these planes were to carry around, such as stages of space launch rockets, combine huge dimensions with quite a low mass. After all, most of the weight of the rocket is made up of fuel, which is filled in right before the launch. This combination was the source of very particular requirements for these planes. Huge cargo bays were a priority, while the carrying capacity was something secondary. Ironically, the high wing configuration did not allow to increase the dimensions of the plane, and therefore of the cargo area as well. The guys from Douglas came to an obvious solution, to place the cargo above the fuselage in a special fairing. Something similar would be done later on with the Soviet airlifter VMT Atlant. But such configuration would lead to a considerable complication of the loading process, and this would also mean that at least the aft section of the plane would have to be redesigned, because the classic empennage became almost useless with a huge fairing in front of it. Essentially, all these problems could be solved, but not within the limits of the meager budget offered by NASA. Aerospace liners found a better solution for these problems, as they managed to get a hold of a decommissioned Boeing 377, modified its fuselage and the aft section, barely changing anything else. No frills. This is how the famous and tubby Aerospace Liner's pregnant Goopy was born. A success for the piston grandpa and a sad story for its turboprop descendant. The production of this plane was basically seized with a batch of 15 C-133Bs that were delivered in 1961. These planes were rapidly losing their job. At first, a significant part of their work was relegated to the new jet C-141 Starlifters, and with the advent of the C-5 Galaxy, there was no need for the cargo masters whatsoever. 
The C-133 were a part of the military transport aviation until 1971, and after participating in a series of missions in Vietnam, they were rapidly decommissioned. Part of the fleet was cut in pieces, while some of them were sent to storage on the famous Davis Mountain Mega Parking in the Arizona desert. They were operated for just 14 years, which is an extremely small amount of time for an airplane. There were, of course, some ideas to resuscitate these big guys for new missions, but most of these ideas would bump into excessive investments they required, and the limitations imposed by aviation authorities, which were not keen on approving the operation of planes that did not shine in terms of safety even when they were freshly built. It was quite a questionable airplane for Douglas as well. On one hand, it was a revolution, and brought a lot of new technologies and solutions into aviation. But on the other hand, it could hardly be regarded as a success. So after the C-133, the company didn't really get involved in military transport aviation. Although its return in the beginning of the 90s was quite epic. This is how the story of the first large turboprop airlifter ends. A story that was bright, but short. And with sparkles. But the era of heavy military transport aviation was just beginning, and each of the descendants of the good old cargo master were getting cooler and cooler. We will get to know them as well pretty soon. In the meantime, like and subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.